many volunteers. You guys just do an awesome job of um, of always standing up and working and just doing a tremendous job to support our church and what's going on here. Because all this doesn't just happen by chance. Um, there is a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on. So, you know, thank you guys for all your hard work, uh, what you put into it. Um, we're finishing up our series today on the Holy Spirit, obviously with the culmination of the day of Pentecost. And um, we've got kind of a strange sermon today. I'm just going to go ahead and brace you for it. Um, you know, stranger than normal. Um, when, I was, when I was growing up, um, I was a, you're going to find this truly strange too. I was an, kind of an odd kid. No, really, I was. Um, I, I love to read. As a matter of fact, um, when, when we had chores to do, we, were in one, we grew up in one of those old-timey houses where my dad said, you, you're going to have chores to do around the house. Well, um, one of his favorite punishment chores was to go pick weeds. Um, and in July, you know, when we were in summer, and, and we lived in this house that had hardly no grass in the front yard. It was all these pine trees, so there was just tons of weeds. Well, I'd get out there, and I didn't want to do it because it was hot, and it was weeds, you know, and I, was, I didn't see the point in it. So I wouldn't pick them, and uh, I know you find that hard to believe, too. But, uh, and my brother would have, like, a whole five-gallon bucket full of weeds, and I would have, like, one or two, you know, and my, and he, my brother would go, Dad, punish Scott because he's not doing the job. So my dad would make me go to my room, which is what I wanted to. I wanted to go to my room to read. And um, I, liked, I, I, liked, I liked all the classics as a kid. You know, the, you know Batman, Superman, <laughs> Spider-Man, you know, the classics. Um, and one of my favorite comics growing up was Iron Man. And... Um, Today, I want to show you that they've done some, some of the movies from Iron Man uh, that you guys may have seen before, um, but this is a clip from the Iron Man movie, all right? And I promise you, I'm going to tie this into the Holy Spirit, all right? I promise you I will. So just bear with me through it, all right? Okay, let me give you some background on this, all right? Because you're looking at me like, I don't know how this works in the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the media team came to me today, and they went, are you sure you want the clip, Ron? And I said, run it. Um, and they were like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. All right, what, what was happening there is um, his assistant is named Pepper, and she was putting this arc reactor into Tony Stark, right, who is our hero. He is Iron Man. And um, that, that, that arc reactor, um, it is says later on in the movie, it contains the power of three uh, gigajoulions, which is, um, which is a term that uh, it's about, it has about the same amount of power in it, okay, than three nuclear reactors, okay? And it's in, the, it's in a thing of a tennis ball. Now, you and I know that there's no way that can possibly happen. But he's a superhero, man. You know, he makes it work. So uh, all the superheroes are like that. But what's interesting is this. Um, as much power as Tony Stark has in him through that arc reactor, the Bible says that you and I have more that's in us. Let me read you a passage of Scripture, and we're not going to have it up on the board yet because I'm throwing the media team a curveball here. And I'm getting a look from him already. Um, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, I don't know how much power it takes to raise somebody from the dead. But I imagine it's more than three power, three nuclear reactors. Right? Now, listen. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This morning we're going to talk about, and we're going to finish up our series on, you know, we, we talked about some of the evidences of the Holy Spirit. But I, you know me, I like to talk about the tangible things. How does 
you know, how exactly on a day-to-day tangible things does the, what does the Holy Spirit do for us? Okay? Those that are filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so we're going to talk about that today. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, this is your word. And, and Father, it gives life. It, it is unique in so many ways. It is living and active, yet it is mysterious and it falls like the rain, but it does not return to you void. And something about rain produces life in, in a mysterious way in plants and in animals and in human beings. But your word is spiritual. And yet it reacts to us even physically. It is so mysterious in so many ways. And the Holy Spirit works in conjunction with your word to breed life in us and to bring us to points and places in our lives, Lord, where we can hear directly from you because you dwell within us. Father, thank you for the awesome power that resides in us. Lord, would you help us, I pray, to come to know in a deeper, deeper understanding through faith what exactly resides in us that produces the power, Father, and help us to tap into it in a, in a, in a more deeper way than when we ever have before in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles... Um, Turn to the Gospel of John. We're going to be um, in the seventh chapter. If you don't have your Bibles and you didn't bring it, don't don't sweat it. We're going to throw it up on the screen for you. Um, let me get my Bible turned back on. Okay. We're going to be in the seventh chapter of John. And the 37th verse. Give me a good old-fashioned amen when you get there. Amen. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. Um, on the last day, that great day of the feast, this is talking about the Feast of Weeks, which is really neat. The Feast of Weeks in the Old Testament, okay, was what um, the culmination of it, came 50 days after the wave offering of Passover. Okay? Which everybody's looking at me like, what? Okay. 50 days after Passover in the New Testament is known as the day of Pentecost. So, it's, there's, there's not, it's not, symbol, it's not symbolic and it's not irony. It's God's will that Jesus would say this. Okay? Think about this. This is the day of, this, this will be a year from this point, right here. Jesus will die on the cross, and the day of Pentecost will happen. So a year to the day when Jesus dies of, and Pentecost happened, Jesus says these words. Listen. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What are those rivers of living water? That's the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, now listen. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus had yet not been glorified. Meaning Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet, right? He hadn't died on the cross. He hadn't descended and then been raised from the dead in the third day. And then, you know, then gone through the day, the, the 40 days where he appears to everybody. Then he ascends up to heaven. Then the Holy Spirit is, is released. Now, Jesus, that hadn't happened yet. But Jesus is prophesizing here and he says, there will come a day and age just like in the, in the, uh, just like in the Old Testament when Joel says, and when, when, when it's prophesied, God says this. He says, I will put your law, I will put my law in your heart. 
Well, everybody wondered, how in the world can that happen? Well, it happens because God gives you himself, right? He gives you the Holy Spirit. You see, it used to not be like that. In the Old Testament, God's Spirit, there's one or two occasions in the Old Testament where God actually places his Spirit in somebody. But but the majority of the time, it it doesn't happen like that. It happens like this. Um, God's Spirit kind of comes upon people. It doesn't reside in them. It just kind of comes upon them. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. In in Judges 6.34, this is the story of Gideon. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet. Anybody want to try that word right there? And the Abrazorites, yeah, gathered behind him. All right, Judges 14, 6, this is about Samson. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, talking about Samson, and he tore apart, or he tore the line apart as he would have torn apart a young goat. Y'all ready for some Memorial Day lunch now? You know, I'm talking about a guy who never needed a butcher. Next, let me tell you a couple more. First Samuel eleven six. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul, and when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. This is when Saul goes and he prophesies, right? And then you, and then after he disobeys God, he never has that spiritual gift again. And and the Bible says that, that the Spirit of the Lord never came upon him ever again. Last one here. Then Samuel took the horn of oil. This is about when he's um, when he is going to um, anoint David. Remember, David and all his brothers are out, and he 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 he, he goes down the whole list, and they, there's all they, all they all look like kings. They all look like they ought to be in this position. And then uh, Samuel gets to the end of it, and he says, "Is this all your sons?" And Jesse says, "Well, there's one. He's a little runt pup, and he's out watching the sheep." And he goes, "Go get him!" and and the Bible says that when that when Samuel saw David, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he anointed David, which is a signal, you know, oil is always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So when he anoints David, the Bible says this, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and he went to Ramah. You see... Up to this time, when, before Jesus comes, right, and after Jesus dies, the Spirit of the Lord never resides in people. One or two times in the Old Testament, and, and even, the, even if you read the translations, they're kind of vague, depending on uh, uh, how they're translated from the Latin to the English. But they're kind of vague. And the majority of the time, the Spirit of the Lord just comes upon people. But Scripture tells us now, Afterwards, after Jesus comes, that now God's Spirit resides in me and in you. All right? Just like Tony Stark, who had that power core in him, we have a power core in us that's far more powerful than that. What are some of the things that the power of the Holy Spirit does that are tangible things in our lives. The, the first one is this. God's Spirit gives us the power to heal our broken lives. If you ever read, um, and I'm going to give you some comic book depth to go with this sermon, all right? And it's all free. If you ever read any of Stan Lee is the creator of a lot of the major comics that you know all of us geeky people like to read. Um, how many of you like Big Bang Theory? You, you watch Big Bang? Oh, no, yeah. Okay, that's a different sermon. Um, oh, that show is so cool. Uh, Bazinga! All right. Um, what What happens though is Stan Lee is this. Um, Stan, Stan Lee's this creator, and in all of his heroes, these heroes always have flaws. They're always flawed in some way. They always have some type of weakness. And in Tony Stark's case, and in Iron Man's case, um, the, the outer shell that he wears, is he, he's invincible on the exterior. 
Nothing can penetrate it. Missiles, bombs, anything else. Nothing can penetrate it. But on the inside, there's something wrong with him. As a matter of fact, it's kind of an in-your-face type of wound. Tony Stark has no heart. He literally has no heart. His body runs off of this, this power core. And, and, and he's a wounded man inside. And he's wounded from a battle that took long, took, 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 that happened long, long ago that wounded him and it broke him and it broke, literally broke his heart. And this power core, it acts, it gives him, it sustains him through this brokenness. If you ever watch the Iron Man movies, you can see and you, you watch the fact that, that Tony Stark, he acts like he has no heart many times because he literally doesn't have a heart. Well, in the same way, that's what the Holy Spirit does to us because you and I, when we come to know Jesus Christ and even after we know Jesus Christ, we're broken. We're broken. Paul says this to the church in Rome in the seventh chapter. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, meaning what I want to do, meaning that Paul wanted to be good, that I do not practice. But what I hate, the very thing that I despise, the thing that I don't want to do, that I do. If then I do, what I will not to do, or what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Right? Meaning this. When Paul sins, he lays, he lays witness to the fact that the law or the Old Testament is true. Right? That's why God gave us the Old Testament. God gave us the, 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 the Ten Commandments because it is, a, it is, we've said this before, it's a mirror, right? It's a reflection. It gives us an accurate reflection. When we look into the Ten Commandments, we haven't just broke one of them, we've broken them all. And Paul says, when I sin, it just lays claim to the fact that the Ten Commandments is true. And that when God gave it, God, it, God was good in giving it because it, it is an indicator of our sin in our lives. Keep going. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin that dwells in me. Now, this isn't the same thing as the devil made me do it. Right? Some people will say that sometimes. They'll say, you know, well, the devil made me do it. We get that sometimes in our house and our kids. Right? That's not what we're talking about. We're all born with a sinful nature. Right? We're all products of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve willfully sinned in the garden, and everybody since then was not only, you're not only born into sin, but you're born with a sinful nature. Right? Meaning you're inclined to do things that are bad. You don't have to teach kids how to be selfish. Right? It just comes natural to them. Right? You've got to teach kids to be what? To be good. Y'all, you really do realize you've got to teach kids to be good, Right? Because that was kind of weak response there. Because we're all born with a sinful nature. So and then Paul goes on to say this. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, my sinful nature, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. Meaning I want to do good, but I find myself that I can't. Because when people cut me off in traffic in bike week then they deserve what they get. <laughs> that hit home. Oh, man, that hit home. Half of you were laughing and half of you looked mad at me. Then. Stop that, preacher. Nothing good dwells in me. For to will or to want to do good, it's present with me. But how to do good or how to perform what is good I do not find or I do not know how. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. But the very evil I will, I, I don't want to do, 
that I practice. Paul's really talking about a life here in some regards with a life that's married to the law. And he was talking about a fact of how uh, within our own power, we can't hold the law. We, we, we can't do it. Under our own power, we can't keep ourselves from sinning. It, do, it doesn't just come down to willpower. It doesn't just come down to, to try our best. You know, it does that. Paul's saying you can't do that. You'll never succeed because even if you want to do good, you're going to find out that you can't do good because there is a sinful nature in you. Let me say this real quick too because I used to have, I had a whole, I, when I was first coming out of my addictions and coming out of all those things, uh, there was this old timey country preacher. He used to come and volunteer his time. Um, at, at his labor and few where I was where I was in treatment at and where I was going through all my stuff at and he used to spend a lot of time with me God bless him I mean I mean he just had to have the spirit of God in him to deal with me at that time because I was a rascal and um, he he would say Scott I'm gonna compare it to you like this there's two dogs in you and they're both fighting for control of you and whichever one you feed the most that one's going to grow. There's a spirit dog and there's a flesh dog. And when you keep feeding your flesh, that flesh dog's going to grow. And right now, your spirit dog is a 98-pound weakling. you got to feed it. What he was saying was this. He was saying, but for those that have, those that have uh, the Spirit of God in them, Right, and we receive the Spirit of God when we ask Christ into our lives, when we repent of our sins, we receive the Holy Spirit. That is the seal of redemption that we get that Paul talks about in Corinthians. We get the seal of redemption. That's how we know that we're saved. Right? But as we start to walk with the Holy Spirit, can two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Amos 3.3, 3, right? As we start to walk with the Holy Spirit, then we come into this relationship with God and we want to do the things of God. And God empowers us, listen, to not do the sin that we used to do. And if you do commit that sin, it bothers you because you come under conviction, right? Remember we talked about last week how the Spirit convicts, convicts us of sin and of righteousness? Meaning not just of the sin, the wrong in our life, but in the right of our life. Here's the things that the Holy Spirit does according to Scripture in our lives. God's Spirit is designed to do these things according to the Scripture. Next one for me. God's Spirit gets inside of your heart. Right? He repairs that which was broken. He removes the diseased parts of your soul. When you're sick, who do you go to? Well, husbands, you don't do it unless your wife makes you. But you're supposed to go to the doctor. Right? Well, it's because the doctor has the doctor has uh, wisdom right now and the ability to help get inside your body and to figure out what's wrong with you, right? Well, it's the same way when we come to know God. God helps us in our lives repair the broken parts of our lives through the Holy Spirit who resides in us. He makes you new again. I had a conversation with a guy a while back, and um, and we were in counseling together. And I'm going to tell I'm going to I want to tell you part of this. And I asked him if I could, and he said I could. Um, and um, he said, um, "Hey, um, my name is Steve," and it wasn't Steve. <laughs> um, and he said, um, "It's nice to meet you. I've heard a lot of nice things about you. Um, I just got saved a couple of days ago." And um, I'm a drug addict. And I said, Steve, no, you're not. And he said, yeah, I am. And I said, no, you're not. And he said, what do you mean? And I took him to Corinthians in the passage that says, if you two have been, if you are saved, I'm going to paraphrase this, okay? I'm gonna, if you two are saved, then you are a new creature or creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed, right? New things have come. I said, now you read that scripture and tell me what it says. 
And he said, well, I'm Steve, and, and I'm a new creation in Christ. I said, that doesn't, that's a far cry from a drug addict, didn't it? And he said, yeah. There's a power that resides within you of the living God. And from it flow streams of living water. Old things have passed. New things have come. Flip that up one more time too. He's fixing you on a constant basis. God, man, that, I don't know about you, but that just brings hope to me. God's never going to leave me alone. Praise God, because the Lord knows I need it. And he's constantly working on me, meaning that we never get to the point where we have arrived. He is continually removing the deadness of sin from your heart. God gives us a power to heal and to deal with our broken lives. Next one. He is faithfully putting God's word inside of you to heal you. The same spirit that wrote the Bible is the same spirit that lives within you. Um, a while back, we, um, I live in North Carolina, you know, and we, just across the line, and every now and then we'll have power outages just randomly. I mean, there's no storms in the area, just boom, power goes out. Well, boom, one day the power went out a while back, and, um, and uh, so I ran up to CVS to get some batteries because it was like nighttime and I didn't have any because I have kids. And all the batteries I buy, they eat them or something. I don't know what they do with the dang thing. They put them in toys at beat bop, blah, 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 and they're all, all of a sudden the, the batteries are dead within 20 minutes. Batteries that would last you a year last me about 15, 20 minutes at tops. Okay, I mean, we go through one. We need to take up a separate fund here from battery fund for the pastor's family. All right, but uh, what, what happened was I went through my my battery drawer, which is now secret a secret battery drawer I don't tell anybody about, but I went to the battery drawer at that time and I didn't have any batteries for my flashlight. So I thought, well, I'm going to run up here to the CVS, which is right down the street from us, and I'm going to grab some batteries. So I pull into the CVS, and it's pitch black too, and I walk up to the thing expecting the doors to open up. And they don't, and I run right into them. And then, uh, you know, the lady's at the other side. She hears something hit the door on the outside, and she doesn't know if somebody's breaking in or something. And she comes, and I said, I need to get in to get some batteries. And she went. <laughs> and I went, what, you don't have any batteries? And she went, can't sell you any batteries. And I was like, why? She was like, we have no electricity. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm telling you what, man, there's something about kids that make your mind go to jello. But uh, again, that's another different sermon. But she said, we can't, you know, none of the registers work, you know, none of the computers work. We can't even get the cash drawers open. Even if you had the right cash, we can't sell you anything. And I thought to myself, Because they don't have any electricity, they can't do what they were meant to do. And, and the fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit residing in you gives you the power to do what you were created to do. When we come to know Christ Jesus... Um, one of the things, and this is our second point, he empowers you to live a power-filled life. Throw that passage of scripture up there, can you, Colleen? Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which we cannot which cannot be uttered. You know, we are supposed to pray. But sometimes, have you ever gotten to the point where you just don't feel like you can pray? Really? I'm the only one? Or have you ever gotten to the point where it feels like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and coming right back down? You know, kind of like that ping pong effect. 
Have you ever feel like sometimes you get so emotional you can't pray over something? Well, take comfort in the fact that during those times, the Bible tells us that the Spirit is making intercession for you. He is interceding for you in these times when you, are, when, when you can't necessarily bring yourself to a point where you need to pray. And also, the Spirit also does this for us as well. Now, he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Uh, hang on. Can we go back to that real quick? Interesting here. There are times in our lives when God, when God starts to move in our lives and he's interceding his will into your life. Does that make sense? Um. And here, here's how Paul wraps it up in a bow, and he, he talks about this next passage. And we know that all things, we all know this one. This is on all, this is the coffee cup version. You know, everybody has it on coffee. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so what, what does that mean? It, it kind of means this. One of the things is when you get in a situation where things have gone bad. Okay? You ever been there? God's Spirit is at work in you to, to not give you some type of cookie-cutter type solution, but He's working specifically on your problem, unique just to you, in order to find a solution that is, that is according to God's will. Because we all know that things that happen to us, there are not always good things, are they? And Paul tells us here, even the most, even the good things or the bad things, it doesn't matter. God's spirit is at work for his will in your life because he loves you and because he has the power to do these things in order to bring about his will in your life. For listen, for those that are called to him, right? For those, another verse that says of this, for those that love him. God empowers us to do these things to bring about this His will in our lives. And what's huge about that too is even when things go wrong. Um, there's, a, there's a lady that I was talking to this week. She sent me this really long letter about, um, and I don't want to get into a lot of the specifics of it, but she's really going through a tough time right now in her life. And uh, they had some really bad stuff happen uh, months ago. And ever since then, she's just kind of been in a crisis of faith. And everything she hears, she kind of filters it through this crisis of faith. And when I was reading the scripture this week, I couldn't help but think about her, how to know that God's spirit is at work in the midst of these things in her lives in order to bring about his will in her life. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about when it comes to that is this passage right here. And I'm going to close with this. Y'all don't want me to close, do you? <laughs> okay, we can go longer. We only got one service today. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one place accord. Uh, they were all in one accord. Blah, blah, blah. Can we go back to that? Because I butchered it. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. Okay? Jump to the... All right. After that happened, all right, so, so they, they, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's what happened. Then Peter pre preaches this sermon, and for the sake of time, I won't go through all the scriptures to describe that, but Peter pre preaches one of the greatest sermons ever preached, probably. 3,000 people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior that day. But this is the conclusion of it. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the... Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children. Whew, praise God. And to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call.
Okay, now let me say this. We were talking about how the Holy Spirit, He powers you in your life. All right? Think about this. Just 50 some days earlier, all right? Now, Peter preaches one of the greatest sermons probably that's ever been preached, and really the birth of the church happens really after this sermon, the the filling of the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches this sermon, and all of a sudden they go from a congregation of 12 to 3,012. That's that's church growth right there. I'm telling you. I've been in church planning for 15 years, guys. Never seen a, a, an opening launch day go like that. All right? Now, that's a launch right there. That's how you do it. Right? 50-some days earlier, this same Peter, he wouldn't even acknowledge Jesus Christ to a poor in front of a poor servant girl. He didn't just deny Jesus once. He denied Jesus three times. Right? Fifty-some days later, he gets up and preaches one of the greatest sermons probably that's ever been preached. Three thousand souls are brought. Now, what changed in that man from fifty days earlier? The giving of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I want you to see. The the power of the Holy Spirit, if you will surrender yourself to Him, what happens in our life is God brings us to this point where the, the power of God resides in you so that you can overcome the things that have hindered you. Not only that, but the power of the Holy Spirit gave Peter the power to witness to others about Jesus and to help others. That's a big deal. All right, I'm going to go back to the movie clip, but I promise you this is the last time I'll go to the movie clip, all right? In in the movie clip right there, Tony Stark's assistant, Pepper, says, I can't do this. And the hero says this, I don't know of anybody who's more qualified to do this than you. I don't know of anybody who's more qualified to do this job than you. And that's the same thing your hero is saying to you. That's the same thing that Jesus Christ says to us. When we say, I can't, I can't witness to this co-worker, Lord, about Jesus. Jesus is saying this. I don't know anybody more qualified than you. I've placed you in this particular place, in this, in this area, at this time, for this reason. I don't know if I can really help this person right now. Remember, Pepper Potts was helping Tony Stark. And the power of the Holy Spirit helps us, Paul says this, it helps us in our weaknesses. So when there are times in our lives when we necessarily don't want to do anything, but we know that it's necessarily right to do anything, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do those things. And here's the thing. It's not because of me or you or because of what we've done to deserve it. It is because of the Holy Spirit that resides in in us from the spirit who raised the dead now resides in you the power to heal a broken life and then the power to help others the power to enable you to walk with God lives and resides within you and it is streams of living water please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer Father in the name of Jesus thank you so much Lord for the day of Pentecost Lord thank you so much for your spirit that dwells within us May we fully come to grasp the fact of how you, the Holy Spirit, wants to heal us, wants to heal our hearts, wants to repair us. 
Lord, so that we may be power-filled in a world and that we may resemble Christ to a world that so desperately needs it. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and the giving of your spirit to those. My prayer today is for those that do not know you as Savior, that they would know you. Father, I pray as we go about the rest of our Memorial Day weekend, would you, through your spirit, Father, impress upon us the things that we need to hear, the things that we need to know about you. Please keep all safe, I pray, Father, in the name of Christ. Please bless all those that have entered in here today and those that haven't, Father, part of this congregation, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are dismissed.